Okay, is everybody here? Anyone who's not here, raise their hand. <laughs> yeah, we uh, realize for people who don't visit us often, the parking can be confusing. So we're waiting just a couple of minutes for people finding their way from the parking lot. But uh, since I'm the least important part of the show, if they miss me, that's not a big deal. My name is Ken Janda. I'm the Dean of Physical Sciences, and so I'm here to officially welcome all of you. Uh, it's delightful to see students of all ages. So someone who looks like two, and some of us are considerably older, so there's quite an age, age range, and I'm glad to hear that you're all interested in physics on a beautiful Saturday afternoon. I think we have a heck of a show for you, uh, involving uh, firsts, some demonstrations in honor of uh, physics faculty member John Rosendahl, Rosendahl, who started this event. And then uh, I believe there's gonna be some outside uh, demonstrations for a break so everyone can stretch their legs. And those of you who are really dedicated can come back and learn about the uh, recent uh, observation of the Higgs boson. So it's uh, quite an afternoon of physics. And I'm told we have some students from Aliso Viejo Middle School. Is that right? No? Did they get here? They're the ones who couldn't find the parking? <laughs> Woodbridge High School? Any Woodbridge? Oh, okay. Woodbridge High School? How about New Hart Middle School? Oh. University High School? All right. Cambridge Prep? Do you have a Cambridge? Anyway. Anyway, welcome to all the students. We hope, we hope you get in the habit of coming to UCI and maybe you want to come back in the future. Also want to really thank the Rosendahl family for their support for coming to this and especially to uh, Mr. David Mendel who's helped fund the Physics Roadshow that you're going to see a portion of today. So John Rosendahl and Bill Heiprink started this Physics Roadshow. The idea is they both do really what some of us call pointy-headed research. That's very hard to explain, but they're also wonderful teachers, and so they put together these demonstrations to help people who don't do physics full-time to get interested in the concepts of physics. And Bill has been a real uh, active member of the community in uh, carrying on John's tradition. So they built many of these demonstrations themselves. Uh, okay. Uh, so they visit a lot of middle schools and, and K-12 high school students? Mostly elementary. And Mostly elementary. And uh, I do that occasionally, although now as a dean I don't get to quite that often. And the, the most fun part is uh, the letters you get back from the excited students. And Bill picked one out that uh, I'm going to get to read for you. So dear Professor Hyperin, Haley, and Arcana, thank you for coming to my school. I was excited when I heard you were coming, and I really liked all the experiments. The top three I liked were the can cannon, rocket, and the sailboat. Did you make the experiments? I wish, really wish you could come here every day. I'm going to die if you don't come back. Please come back. <laughs> so with that, I'll turn the program over to Bill. Thank you, Ken. So Ken already touched on this with this uh, program for this afternoon. Uh, Adventures in Physics has four different parts. The first part is actually an assembly uh, that we perform at elementary schools. And um, although some of you are children, and I'm glad you're here, I know not all of you are children. Uh, nevertheless, I think that you'll find this very fun, and it does give you a chance to see if you're smarter than a fifth grader. So, um, but uh, this is part of our program. We have a program here for preparing teachers. It's called CalTeach. And so uh, two undergraduates who are participants in the CalTeach program will be presenting the assembly for you. All of those assemblies actually end with a hands-on time for the kids to get up and try a few of the things themselves. And so that will be our break. It comes, takes us up to around 2.30. Around 2.30, Daniel um, Wrightson is going to speak for about 40 minutes. We'll have some question and answer. Then we'll have yet another break where most of you will probably want to leave, but we'll have a question and answer time for um, 
it's really for high school students, maybe middle school, who want to have who have some questions about um, college, what college is like, and we have an undergraduate panel for that final portion. Okay, with that, that's the, the plan. And now I want to introduce Haley Steele and Arshna Festikopal. And uh, forget the first part. Okay. Uh, they are going to present the show uh, for you as they would as if you were in fourth and fifth grade at one of our schools. And we go out to Orange County schools, often with, with children who don't have as many privileges as, as many of us have. So with that, please take it away. And today I'm going to talk about Newton's laws of motion. And I'm going to show you a different way to look at motion called momentum. And we're going to start off with these slides. We're going to start by reading the words that are underlined. And I'm going to do this. I'm going to read it first. And I want you all to repeat after me. Mass. Mass. Velocity. Velocity. Momentum. Momentum. Conservation. Conservation. They're looking at me like that. <laughs> yeah. So the first one that we're going to talk about today is mass. Mass is the easiest one to understand. Mass is the amount of matter in something. So this beach ball doesn't have much mass. It's really easy for me to lift up. But this medicine ball has a lot more mass. It's a lot more difficult for me to lift up. Something with a lot of mass is hard to get moving. But something with a lot less mass is easier to get moving. And mass also matters when something is already in motion. So let's say I throw this beach ball at Haley. Just a minute, Arch. Oh. Yeah. Doesn't have any momentum. 
because it has a small mass and no velocity. It's not moving. But this medicine ball, when I throw it to Haley, oh it has a big mass, and when I throw it, it has a big velocity. So it has a big momentum. And as you can see, in science, we use letters to symbolize the words and the concepts. So M represents mass, V represents velocity, and P represents momentum. So we're going to do some science math problems because math is really important, especially in science. The, go, the two go together all the time. Also in science, we like to use symbols to uh, represent what we're talking about. So our mass, we uh, use M to represent this. Velocity, we use V. And in this case, we're using momentum, we call that P. So our first situation is a beach ball, and it's moving in that direction with a velocity of 2 and it's mass of 1. Momentum is equal to mass times velocity. Can you guys all tell me what our momentum is in this case? 2. two. Great. So 1 times 2 is 2. So our momentum is in that direction. And this is also shown with the arrow. Our next problem is the same beach ball, but now it's moving a little faster. So we're going to say the velocity is now 5, and the mass is still 1. So what's our momentum? Uh, good job! Yes, <laughs> our momentum is 5. Our third situation is actually a medicine ball. So the medicine ball, is, we're going to say, is 10 times heavier than the beach ball. It has a mass of 10. But like the first situation, it still has a velocity of 2. What's our momentum of the medicine ball in this case? 20, yes. So you guys can see that they are moving at the same speed, but our medicine ball, since it has more mass, has a lot more momentum. And this is also shown with our red arrow for a lot longer. And our last example is the same beach ball, but now it's moving in the opposite direction. So again, to symbolize that, we put a negative in front of it. So our velocity is negative 5, our mass is still 1, so our momentum is negative, negative five. 5. Good job. <laughs> yes. And we show it's going the opposite direction by the arrow and the negative sign. Okay, so when I turn on this air track down here, this is going to represent our car, like our car in our little picture right here. When I turn on this air track, this car is floating on our air track. It's easy to move. So Newton's second law of motion is applying a force in order to change its momentum. So when I push on this cart this direction, I'm applying a force on the cart this way. So its momentum is being changed by this way. When the cart gets down to the end, this elastic applied a force, I'll do that one more time, onto the cart this way, now changing the cart's momentum. It's now going this way. So this is our last idea before we show you some really cool demonstrations. And it's the idea of conservation. In science, when you conserve something, it means you save it. It doesn't go away. It's not, it's not wasted. So what Haley's going to do is she's going to show you how a system of objects conserves momentum before and after an event. So our first situation is an elastic collision. This is a collision where the objects are bouncing off of one another. So we have our first part. Our first part is going to be at rest. It has zero velocity. And our second car is going to be in motion. I think our second car is getting its elastic band, so it's really elastic. <laughs> OK, here we go. So once again, our first car has zero velocity. And our second car is going to be moving in this direction. And we're going to see what happens. As you guys can see, this car stopped right when it hit this car. And this car continued in the same direction with the same velocity that the, origin, that the second car had. Arsh is going to describe a math science problem to us, because math is really important in science. Can we say that already, that math is important in science? <laughs> when we do these demonstrations at elementary schools, we really like to emphasize that math is important in science. <laughs> so, like Haley was showing us, the first car was at rest, so it had a velocity of zero, and we're just going to say that the mass is one. So what's the momentum if it's zero times one? Zero. Not all of you said it, but good job to <laughs> Our second car has a velocity of two and the same mass of one. So what's the momentum, everyone? Two. Two. Good job. So our momentum of the system, which is the two cars, is two plus zero, which is two. 
and with the idea of conservation, the momentum before should be equal to the momentum after. So what is the momentum after going to be if the momentum before is 2? 2. Be confident, that's right. So after, like Haley showed us, the second car that she pushed stopped. It had a velocity of 0. So now that has a momentum of 0. And the, sec the first car, which was originally at rest, moved off. So now that has a velocity of 2 and a momentum of 2. So the momentum of the system is 2. Our next situation we're going to do is an inelastic collision. So this time, instead of the cars bouncing off one another, they are going to stick together. But we're going to make sure that we understand that they were doing the same scenarios last time. This car is at rest, our first car is at rest, our second car is going to be in motion towards it, and they're going to stick together. In science, we like to make predictions about things. So that's called a hypothesis. When you make a prediction about something happening, we're making a hypothesis. And that's what you guys are going to do today. So we have four options for what's going to happen. When Haley pushes the car, are they going to stop? Are they going to move off in that direction at the same speed as the original car? Are they going to move off in that direction but slower? Or are they going to move off in the opposite direction? So I want you to raise a finger for which option you think it is. One, two, three, or four. All of you raise your fingers. So one was they move off in the same direction with the same speed. Number two was they move off in the same direction with a, le a lesser speed. Did I mess that up? No, you got it right. <laughs> Number one was they stop. Number two was they move off in the same speed. Number three, a lesser speed. Number four, they go in the opposite direction. So raise your fingers. You guys are all making your hypothesis. Okay, okay, let's go ahead and see what happens. So this car is stopped, and this one's going to be in motion. So if you put up three, you were correct. Good job. Yay! This also works if the car is moving much faster. So I'm going to apply a little bit of a greater force on this car. It's going to have a greater velocity. As you can see, they still move off with a smaller speed. Again, I'm going to show you this in terms of math, because math is really important in science. <laughs> so, the first car, just like she had it before, is moving, but now it's moving faster. So we're giving it a velocity of 10. The masses are still 1. So the momentum of the first car is 10. The momentum of the second car, which was at rest, is 0. So the total momentum of the system is 10 plus 0, which is 10. So the momentum before is 10. What's the momentum after going to be? 10. Good. Look at you guys. So since the moment, we know the momentum after is going to be 10. Since the cars are now combined, their mass is now 2 because 1 plus 1 is 2. And we need to figure out what velocity will give us the momentum of 10. That's why the cars slow down. It needs a velocity of 5, which is half the velocity it had before, to keep the conservation of momentum. Okay, so our third situation is also an inelastic collision. But this time, instead of one car being at rest, they're both going to be in motion. And they're going to be going towards each other. Once again, we're going to make a prediction, because making a hypothesis in science is also important, about what's going to happen. We're going to have three options. First option is that they stick together and stop. The second is that they move off in this direction, slower. Our, at the same speed. And the third is that they move off in the opposite direction. So raise your fingers again. Which option do you think it is? There's only one, two, or three. No five. <laughs> okay, let's go ahead and see what happens. So you guys saw it all basically stop. Let's see if I can do it perfectly. At the end of the uh, show, we'll have you guys uh, have an opportunity to actually work on this and see if you guys can do it better than me. I'm going to do it one more time and see if I can get it perfect. Pretty cool. Yeah. Now we're going to talk about the math behind this problem. So for this, instead of moving at the same direction with one car stop, they're both moving at opposite directions. And like we said before, to symbolize opposite direction, we're going to use a negative. So we have the first car with a velocity of 2 and a mass of 1, so that's the momentum of 2. And the second car has a velocity of negative 2, because it's going in the opposite direction. 
So that has a momentum of negative 2. And in, in, in math, when you add a negative, that's like subtracting. So 2 plus negative 2 gives you a, whole, a momentum of 0. So the momentum before is 0, the momentum after is 0. And what you have is the two cars stick together. Again, the mass becomes 2 because of the individual cars. And the momentum is 0. So what velocity gives us the momentum of 0? 2 times what gives you 0? 0. Good job. So we have the velocity of 0, which is why the two cars stop. They've already been selected. Okay. Don't worry, you guys will have an opportunity too. We'll do this after. This is one of the things that we do during the hands on part. Zero. Okay, so before we go ahead and go, we have one more thing to talk about. Newton's third law of motion. So Newton's third law of motion states that we have to, uh, forces come in action-reaction pair. So I'm applying a force on Archna right now, and she's also applying a force back on me. But if I try to apply a force on Archna, and I can't apply that force, then she can't apply a force back on me. Okay? So Sarah, what you're going to do is just hold your hand open like this. Don't hold on to the girls. Don't cry. Okay? So we're going to see what happens. On the count of three, you're going to pull really hard. Okay? 
One, two, there's no one, stay right there. Leave your hands right open. You pull it really tight. Pull it really hard, as hard as you can, Jonathan. One, two, three, pull. What happened? Nothing. Nothing happened because Jonathan was applying force, but we didn't have an equal and opposite force from Sarah. So let's go ahead and try that again. Oh my goodness. <laughs> but this time, Sarah, you pull real hard. Okay, Both people pull time. real hard. You're gonna pull too. Both are going to pull real hard. Okay, on the count of three, you guys ready? One, two, three. Go, 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 go. <laughs> Phil, you guys want to try one more time? Yeah. Phil, back it up a little bit. Harder this time. Okay, pull like this. Okay. Okay. It's like, Okay, count out with him. One, two, three. Oh, yeah. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. Let's have a round of applause for everyone up here. Okay, so we can see by our cans crushing is that we had equal and opposite forces happening. I don't know if you guys can see from up there. We had cans in the middle of our collision car. And by the cut crush cans, it shows that we have equal and opposite forces. So this is, yeah. Okay. So we also have this demonstration where we have a basketball. So it has a lot more mass than our handball. Okay. So we're just going to see what happens when. I don't know if I can balance this perfectly. When I drop this basketball. We see that the handball flew up, but the basketball didn't move very far or very fast. As you guys can see in the picture, the basketball has a lot greater mass, which we have a large M once again, and our handball has a much smaller mass compared to the basketball, so it has a small M. In order for conservation of momentum to take place, we have to have the handball must have a large velocity, and the basketball must have, must have a small velocity. And they are still applying equal and opposite forces on one another. So you have both Newton's forces and momentum happening in that uh, interaction. Next, we're going to do we're going to do a really cool example using this car. Are we going to do the rock? Oh. So we have one really, another really cool demonstration. Professor Heidrich is actually going to do this one, and it's our rocket. Okay. So we have a. Uh, bottle here that has some water in it. If you put a small amount of water, it will go really high during the hands-on portion. Uh, one of the options is to go outside and watch it go really high. Uh, but what we're going to do right now is I put enough, I think I'm not going to hit the ceiling. We'll see. Sometimes it only goes about as high as my head and it's disappointing. We'll find out. This is another example though. Uh, it's going to start from rest. So I push the cork in so it's nice and tight. And it's going to start from rest. So how much momentum does my rocket and water have right now? Zero. Zero. Good. So it's going to be the same thing, that they're going to have equal and opposite momentum. And they're going to exert equal and opposite forces on each other when the rocket shoots up. <laughs> so I'm going to, now going to pressurize the water rocket. <laughs> And uh, so, of course, because the rocket is light, it had, goes really up, up very high. Because it has a small M, but a big V. So we're not going to tell anyone that it's a ceiling. <laughs> 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 so our next, we're going to do the sailboat. Are we going to do the sailboat next? Yeah. It's Cannon's last. Yeah, OK. is a car that's going to represent my sailboat. When I turn on the fan, we have air pushing out this direction. And remember how we're making hypotheses? We're going to do it again. I'm going to put this car on the track with the fan turned on. I want you to tell me which direction you think the boat will go. Do you think it'll go that direction? Do you think it'll stay still? Or do you think it'll go in that direction? So raise your hands, everyone. So our air is blowing that way. Oh, okay. Sorry. Okay. 
So it's just a boat right now, not a sail. This is our sail. We'll put that on later. So it's a boat, and the air is blowing to that way. We'll give them their options one more time about which way so the boat will move. The first option is it'll move this way. Second option is it'll stay still. And third option is it'll move this way. Make your guys' predictions. Okay, let's see what happens. So if you guys predicted it would go this way, you guys are correct. The reason is, is because the force, the, the force of the air is blowing the boat, blowing this way, but the air is also pushing with an equal and opposite force on the bow that way. Okay, conservation and momentum. So air pushes one way, and boat pushes the other. Now, we're gonna make it a little bit trickier by adding the sail to it. So now, we still have air coming out, but think about what direction it's going. So our air is still blowing this way. This way. We're not going to give you guys any more hints. Yeah. You guys are going to predict what you think. Do you guys think? Same, same options. Will it move this way? Will it stay still? Or will it move this way? So raise your fingers. Hold up your guys' predictions. Okay, let's see. Okay. It's moving slowly, but it's moving this way. So those of you who pick three are correct. <coughs> it's in that direction. Okay, so what is happening is our air is still blowing in this direction, but now it's hitting this sail. So when it hits the sail, the air is now going this way. But we know by Newton's third law of motion, equal and opposite forces, what direction is our force going now? This way. So that's why our boat is moving this way. So the force of the boat on the air is to the left, but the force of the air on the boat is to the right. And that's why the boat and these, the mo momenta are equal. Okay. Next. Now is it the cannon? I think so. Okay, now we have one final but really yes. cool demonstration. You can guess what it is. Yeah, it's a cannon. So this is our cannon. Put a little more in here. Yeah. So that's what really is That's good. She knows how to deal with the good nitrogen. If you guys ever come into contact with it, be very careful. Arshina, will you hold the back of our So I'm just going to go ahead and pound our tackle. Okay. Oh, come on, Haley, a little more. More? Back a little, but not as much as the cannonball shoots up. 
Okay. okay. Now we're going to make sure you guys are paying attention because we're going to have a little review. Okay. So the first question is, what is mass? Really tricky. First option, the amount of matter or stuff in something. Second, how fast something is moving. Third, something heavy that is moving fast. You guys already have your hands up. Look at you. I am waiting for everyone to make their prediction on what the answer is. Okay, let's see. Good. I saw a lot of ones. Most of you were correct. It's one. It's how much matter or stuff is in something. So velocity, let's go ahead and go over what two and three are. Velocity is how fast something is moving. And something with a large momentum is something that is heavy that is moving fast. We have one more question for you guys. A rifle fires a bullet. What is the same afterwards? Is it A, the mass of the rifle and the mass of the bullet are the same? Is it B, the velocity of the rifle and the velocity of the bullet are the same? Or is it C, the momentum of the rifle and the momentum of the bullet are the same, but in opposite directions? So raise your fingers. One, two, or three. Those of you who picked three are correct. So the momentum of the rifle and the momentum of the bullet are the same. Conservation of momentum. So as you guys can see in our picture, our masses aren't the same. Our mass of our rifle is much greater than our bullet, and our velocities aren't the same. Our velocity of our bullet is much greater than our velocity of our rifle. But they still have equal and opposite forces acting on one another. So that concludes the demonstration part of our assembly, and we're going to have a really fun hands-on part after. Okay, so... So this is an opportunity to get up and, and, and move around. If you need to use the restroom before Professor Whiteson start, starts his talk, you can actually go out the doors and just to, to the right are some rest oh, and to the left as well. There's some restrooms there. We have a lot of hands-on activities. So, uh, Haley, what can people do with you? I'm going to be up here with the air track, and you guys can go ahead and work with elastic and inelastic collisions. Archana, what, what can people do with you? I'll be over here with the cards that you saw earlier, so if you want a chance to get on it and each other, come to me. Or, just a minute, we also have these, which are like our air track collisions. You can let one ball go and see what happens, or two balls, or you can have them come from opposite directions pulling on each side. These are set up all around. I do ask that you treat them gently, because they, when they get tangled, it's really hard to untangle them. So parents, please keep an eye on your kids so they don't go like that. Um, and then the fourth option is I'm going to take the water rocket outside and shoot off the water rocket. And that will be right out in the courtyard out there. So we will come back at, we'll have 15 minutes for this, so we'll start at 2.25 with Professor Weissman's talk about the discovery of the day. conservation and but this now we're turning to some of the research at our university. We're a research university so I don't just go out to elementary schools I mean we, we teach college students and we also do lots of research. Our speaker today is professional, Professor Daniel Whiteson. Uh, he received his PhD from Berkeley a little over 10 years ago. His, uh, he has won many awards. He has a Sloan Fellowship, a Fulbright, and another one that I forgot, oh, the DOE Department of Energy Junior Investigator one. So those are the kinds of things that get you, get you promotions at the university. But he has another claim to fame, uh, which is that he is a collaborator on web comics, and so he's done one about the HIG, and about dark energy, and extra dimensions. So Daniel, take it away. All right, thank you everybody. Thank you for that invitation. And thanks everybody for coming out. Uh, that was really an amazing show, guys. I, was, I haven't seen that one before. It was wonderful. 
Um, so I'm grateful to get to talk to you guys about my research. It's something I'm really interested in. And I'm grateful to you for coming and showing your interest. I'm always amazed at how much interest there is by the general public in a sort of um, in a very esoteric corner of, of physics, which is particle physics. Now, what you're looking at here, this video I put up for your enjoyment, is the assembly of the Atlas detector. And I'll tell you a lot more about it later. But this is one of the biggest machines ever made by man. And it was put together over about a 15-year period by a team of thousands of graduate students and postdocs. It's been compressed down to about 30 seconds for your enjoyment. And you can see the whole thing has been assembled. Um, and, I, and it's interesting how much attention there is in particle physics. There is attention not just scientifically, but also in a popular sense. And I'm particularly gratified to see, for example, uh, particle physics appear in the New Yorker. So this is a, a comic from the New Yorker. Frequently asked questions about the Hadron Collider. And it's pretty funny. It's like, how does the Hadron Collider work? Well, you didn't even understand 11th grade math, so why are you asking? Right? So like that. Or uh, what would happen if you put a cat inside the large Hadron Collider? Answer, I don't know. All right. Now, and it's funny to see this in the popular culture. This sort of plays on the joke that everybody feels like, ha, 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 I can never understand particle physics, right? We all spend our taxpayer dollars to build this thing some people are playing with. We could never figure it out. And while that's a funny joke, I'm hoping that today I can convince you that you can understand it. Because the interesting thing about particle physics and the interesting thing about the Large Hadron Collider are not the technical details, but the basic motivation, why we're doing it, and the answers that we get, what we learn about the universe. And so that's what I'm going to try to show you today, how we use momentum at the Large Hadron Collider to explore the universe around us. And for me, science is about exploration. When I was a kid and I was learning about all the people sailing around the world, discovering new continents, I thought that was awesome. I thought, I would love to figure out something new. I would love to be the first person to step on a new continent, the first person to land in South America, the first person to, to reach the South Pole. That would be really exciting, right? But in this modern day and age with satellites and everything, we basically figured out where everything on the Earth is. And so you feel sort of like everything's used up, right? You can't get in a ship and go off and discover something unless it's a tiny new island. But it turns out that's not true. You just have to look a little, a little harder. There's a huge amount of exploration left around us. It's just not the same kind of exploration. And it's the exploration of the universe, figuring out what everything is made of, understanding how everything works. All right? <clears throat> so what do I mean by exploration? What do I mean by figuring out how things work? I'm talking about tapping into the basic questions that we have, the questions that everybody wants to know the answer to, even if you're not a part of the physics. Basic questions that people have been asking since they were people. And I'm talking about the kind of questions like my four-year-old asks me, you know, questions like, why are we here? Uh, who are we? Uh, what is it like to be a bat, right? Basic questions that we all ask. And if you're laughing about that one, this is actually the title of one of the most cited papers in philosophy ever. Not a joke. Um, so these are important questions, questions we all want to know the answer to. Questions if, if we knew the answer, we feel like it would change our relationship with the universe, right? Now these are philosophical questions, and so not really probable by, by modern science, but there are, are other questions, questions I think are at the same caliber, caliber of importance, the same level that everybody can understand, right? Questions like, what are things made of? How do those things interact? Why is there anything rather than nothing? Uh, what is mass anyway? Where did everything come from? What is the future of the universe? These questions, in my mind, are as big as the other questions, maybe even more important. And the difference is, these are physics questions, which means we can make hypotheses, we can do experiments, and we can learn the answers. These questions have answers that we can figure out just by doing experiments and being clever and building massive toys underground in Switzerland, right? So this is what's exciting is that there is still exploration left to be done. There are questions out there that are fascinating to anybody, everybody. You sit in an airplane next to somebody, they ask me, what are you doing with particle physics? They say, whoa, what does that mean? I can tell them we're answering these questions, right? So let's talk in more depth about one of these questions that I think is the most interesting, and that's this one. What is the world made out of? A question people have been asking themselves since cavemen took two rocks and broke them together into smaller rocks, right? And wondered, huh, how long can I break this rock into smaller and smaller rocks? Right? Now, imagine you're the first person to ever think of this question, okay? And your job is to figure out what the universe is made out of. And nobody's ever thought about this before. What would you do? Well, you start out just looking. What is around me, right? Start cataloging the things you see. And there's a lot of different stuff out there, right? 
And very quickly you discover that the universe has rocks, it has people, it has Sundays, you know, it has all sorts of stuff, and it's an overwhelming diversity. It's amazing. Our universe is full with an almost infinite variety of stuff, right? Which makes it very difficult to categorize, to understand what everything is made out of. But you're a good scientist, you're going to tackle this question dutifully, so what you're going to do is try to organize everything, right? You say, well, I'll put all the plant-like stuff over here, I'll put the rock-like stuff over there, I'll put the electronic toys over here, the people stuff over here, and you can argue about whether Arnold Schwarzenegger belongs in the people category, or the thing category, okay? But everything has to be in a category, right? We're doing science, okay? It's got to be fixed and rigid. Uh, but what you discover pretty quickly is that there's a lot of stuff, and it's not easy to categorize, right? Now, zoom forward a couple of thousand years, and you achieve this. Right? This is about uh, 150 years ago, 200 years ago. You achieve the periodic table. Now, you look at the periodic table, it might seem sort of dry. You're like, well, why are you showing me the periodic table? Well, the periodic table is an incredible step forward in this, in this question of what things are made of. You go from a list, basically, a list of everything in the universe, everything in the universe a near infinitely long list, to a list of 100, about 100 things from which you can make anything, anything anybody's ever touched, tasted, seen, heard, interacted with, thought of, can be built using these hundred basic building blocks. That's an incredible step forward, right? From near infinite down to 100. Huge progress, all right? And this is 200 years ago. So that's an incredible insight that the universe is made of smaller things which can be assembled to build the things we, we're familiar with. Right? And you look at this list, you look at this periodic table, and you notice there are patterns, right? And some of you who have taken chemistry know that some of these things are very reactive, and some of these things are very stable, and some of these things are metallic. And I mean, I'm not a chemist, but I know that there are patterns here in the periodic table. And if you look at them, you wonder, why are there patterns? What do these patterns mean, right? And this is why we do science. We carefully categorize all of our information. We look for patterns, because those patterns are clues. They're clues then maybe this description is not the simplest. It's not the final answer. Maybe underlying this periodic table is a simpler idea of which those patterns are clues, right? And now we know, we know that all of the structure of the periodic table comes from how electrons fill up the orbitals around the nuclei. So each of these elements in the periodic table have a different number of protons in their nucleus, and so a different number of electrons orbiting them. And how those electrons get filled determines whether something is active or not active, and, and all of these chemical properties. So the structure of the periodic table comes from a simpler idea. It comes from the structure of the atom, right? Now, if you look inside the atom, you see the atom has electrons whizzing around. And in the center of the atom is the nucleus. The nucleus is made out of protons and neutrons. Your protons are orange. In real life, they don't really have a color. The neutrons are blue. And you open up one of these nucleons, a proton or a neutron, you find something else inside. You find quarks, up quarks and down quarks. So with up quarks and down quarks, you can make protons and neutrons. Sprinkle some electrons around, and you can make an atom. Put those atoms together, and you can make pigs, iPhones, supernovas, anything, right? So we've taken an even another step forward in this quest, right? We've gone from 100 elements, we thought, or good basic building blocks, and we've discovered that with just three kinds of particles, of quarks, down quarks, and electrons, we can make all of those building blocks. So now we've gone from near infinite to about 100, down to three particles. With three particles, we can make anything we've ever seen, touched, or tasted, right? Well, it feels like the answer's almost around the corner, right? We're basically done. We'll figure it out next week, right? Seems like good progress. But there are wrinkles in the story. Okay? Even though it seems like these particles are almost the final answer in this question, it turns out there are more particles. Okay? Uh, Linus Hall, which is just around the ring of our physics building, is named after Fred Linus, who discovered the neutrino. The neutrino is a ghost-like little particle that hardly ever interacts with anybody. But it's everywhere. There's millions and trillions of neutrinos being shot at us from the sun as we speak. But they fly right through us without us hardly feeling them. A single neutrino can go through a light year of lead. A light year is how far light travels in a year, which is very, 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 very far. Now imagine a light year of lead, okay? 
A neutrino can fly right through that. It hardly ever interacts. So why are there neutrinos, right? Why do we have neutrinos? We don't know, but they're there, so they're part of the clues, right? And if you keep looking for particles, which is my job to keep looking for particles, you find that the up quark and the down quark are not the only kind of quarks out there. There are other kinds of quarks with even sillier names. Charm, strange, up, bottom, sometimes called truth and beauty. Uh, and I'm not on the committee to name these particles, unfortunately. I've already named them all after my children. Um, but the weird thing is that the charm quark and the top quark, you write them in a row next to the other ones because they're exactly the same as the up quark, except that they're heavy. So it's like the up quark has two cousins, a fat cousin and a super fat cousin. All right? And you almost never see them because they're too fat to leave the house, but they're there. The down quark also has two fatter cousins, and all of these guys have two more cousins. Why are there these other particles out there? You don't need the top quark or the bottom quark to make hydrogen or to make ice cream or anything. You never see it. You don't need these other particles around, but they're there. They can be made, right? They're on the menu of particles which exist. And now you notice what I've done here is assemble a new periodic table, a periodic table of the fundamental particles. Why did I do that? Well, for the same reason we made a periodic table of the elements. I'm hoping that by assembling our information here, we will notice patterns. Those patterns will lead to questions. Those questions are clues, hopefully, to understand a deeper, more fundamental theory of what's going on in the universe. Right? In 300 years, people will look back and say, oh, that's because they didn't know that the truth was whatever the truth is. So we found these 12 particles, right? And there are lots of questions like, how many particles are there? Are there only 12? Are there a billion? Right? We have no theoretical limit on the number of fundamental particles. None. We've made 12 so far. That doesn't mean there aren't a billion. We don't know. Maybe there's just 13. We have no idea if this is the tip of the iceberg or just an ice cube. Why, are there, why does every particle have exactly two cousins? We're pretty sure now that there are exactly, we call them generations of particles. One, two, three. We're pretty sure there are exactly three. Why three? Three is sort of a strange number. If you look for mathematical purity, right? If, you want to, if your goal is, in the end, to write the equation of the universe on a t-shirt, right? A very simple expression for the whole universe. Then you want to have simple numbers in there. Mathemat mathematicians will tell you simple numbers are zero, one, maybe pi, maybe e, right? But three? Three is a sort of a strange number for that, a, a fundamental number of the universe. Um, unless you're Catholic and you believe that three is you know, fundamentally important for the universe, then maybe that's you know, a clue. Um, but it's, it's an interesting philosophical implication, right? Everything we discover, if it turns out to be fundamental, has interesting philosophical implications because what we're trying to do is understand what's underneath, what's inside, what's making up everything in the universe. All right? Um, we're also curious about, like, why are there six of these particles in the bottom, blue, called leptons, and six of these guys called quarks? Remember, the quarks won't make up the proton and the neutron, and the electron whizzes around. According to our current theory, there's no relationship between these particles. None at all. Right? Now, obviously, there should be some relationship because the charge, the electric charge of the proton, exactly balances the electric charge of the electron so that you can have an atom. Right? If those were two were different by one part in 10 to 10, you would not have stable atoms. But according to our current theory, that's a pure coincidence. Right? That sort of seems like a hint. Maybe there's something going on. These two side beings are two sides of the same coin. There's some relationship there, right? It's unlikely to have such a crazy coincidence. Why do these particles have such strange masses? I've told you that they get heavier, but there's no apparent pattern to why they're heavy. Uh, we use these units in particle physics called GeV. Approximately one GeV is the mass of a proton. So you see an electron is very, very small, 10 to the negative 4 GeV, while a top quark is almost 200 GeV. A single particle, this fundamental particle, a top quark, weighs as much as a gold atom. Right? And the spectrum, look, it's 10 to the 6, the difference between the smallest and the heaviest. We don't understand why there are such different masses. So there's lots of questions. Um, I haven't even addressed the questions about the different forces. There are other particles, photons, Ws, Zs, gluons, and of course, the Higgs boson I'll talk about more, that connect these particles and teach us how they interact. But we just don't really understand a lot about these patterns. <clears throat> now, we have a theory. It's called the standard model. And the standard model is a beautiful theory. It works very, very well. It's extraordinarily precise. It predicts 
all the particle interactions that we've seen and all the experiments we've done have been confirmed, have confirmed the standard model. And it's a very precise theory. In fact, there's one calculation that you can do in the standard model, which you can, which you can um, also measure in experiment, and it gets it right to 11 decimal places. So the theory predicts that you measure a certain number to 11 decimal places, and the measurement verifies each of those 11 decimal places. It's amazingly precise. Right? It's super precise. It's so precise you might think, this isn't just a prediction, maybe it's actually what the universe is using to do the number, to do the calculation, right? I mean, the chance that you can get that kind of prediction um, accurately correct uh, by chance is like the chance of hitting a golf ball in New York and getting a hole in one in China. I mean, it's just impossible for it to be an accident. So we think we're on to something. But you can also judge the standard model not just by how effective it is, but by its simplicity. Right? Because remember, what we want to do is put the standard model on a t-shirt. We want to say, here's the equation of the universe. And so, this is the expression for the standard model. It's actually half of it. I couldn't put the other half on. Uh, and you can ask yourself, is this the fundamental theory of the universe? Is this the final answer? And I would say that, you know, this can't really be the final answer. And there must be a simpler explanation. And I think of it like this. I think we're probably just speaking the wrong language. Because, you know, when you're speaking the wrong language, things look complicated. Like these scientists are listening to the dolphins, and they're writing down phonetically, que pasa, habla espanol. And they have no idea what they're hearing, right? Because they don't speak Spanish, and so nothing makes sense to them. They have to write it down phonetically and record all the details. In the same sense, maybe we're just looking at things in the wrong way. Maybe we're using the wrong mathematical notation. Maybe we're thinking about things the wrong way because of our personal experiences. And that's making it much more complicated than it needs to be. And if we had a new idea, a new way to write things down, a new way to organize our thoughts, it would just snap into place and suddenly we would realize we could just speak Spanish to these dolphins, right? Okay, now, I told you that we've made great progress in understanding matter, and that's true. But we've recently learned that the kind of matter that we've been studying, protons and neutrons and all that stuff that we spent 300 years studying in detail, turns out that's a tiny fraction of the universe. So if you made a pie chart of all the stuff in the universe, the kind of stuff that we are familiar with, the things that make up planets, stars, ice cream, all that stuff, is about 5% of the whole universe. Is there a question? Hey, what are those red blocks? What do they stand for? So these guys, let's see if I have a pointer here. So these are the quarks. These are the leptons I told you about. These are particles I didn't have time to tell you about, but they carry forces. So this is a photon. It carries for particles of light. This W and Z boson. They're a lot like light, but they're very heavy. They have mass, and they carry the weak force. These particles are gluons. They're what's responsible for holding the nucleus together. So these guys, all these guys that fit together, we have some grasp of some understanding, though, of course, not complete understanding, uh, only describes 5% of the universe. Right? Most of the universe is something else. 20% of the universe is something called dark matter. We know it's out there. It doesn't, it doesn't reflect light. It doesn't uh, emit any light. It's dark. It's mysterious. It's heavy. There's a lot of it. And that's about all we know. And the rest of it, so that is 25%, the rest of it, 75% of the stuff in the universe is something we call dark energy. Now, dark matter and dark energy have no relationship except for the word dark, okay? Really, dark energy really just means, it's scientific code for, we have no idea <laughs> what this stuff is. And it really means we have no idea. So dark matter is stuff. It's something that's out there. We've seen that it's there, so we can't really probe it very deeply. Dark energy is what's responsible for making the universe explode. About 10 years ago, people discovered that after the Big Bang, the universe is not slowing down to a big come back into a big crunch. In fact, it's accelerating outwards. And so it's a huge, massive force responsible for accelerating the universe outwards. And that's what most of the universe, the energy and mass of the universe is. So the bottom line, though, is that we thought we'd made great progress in understanding what's out there in the universe. Turns out we were looking at a tiny, unusual sliver of what the universe is made of. Right? It's very humbling. Um, so how do we know dark matter is out there? Well, there's a couple of ways. One is that you look the way you look at galaxies out in the sky, and you look at how they rotate. 
And the way the speed of something moving around a galaxy depends on the amount of stuff that's inside because it's all gravitational, it's pulling it in. The more mass that's in the, in the galaxy, the faster things should be going around. So what they did is they looked at the velocity as a function of the distance from the center of the galaxy. And what they expected was this curve, based on just adding up all the mass from all the stars they saw. And then they measured it, and they saw something totally different. And that is a magical moment in science, right? When you discover that your theory is totally wrong. That's like a joyous moment, because you're on the verge of learning something. It's a clue, right? Here is where you're wrong. And here's a, the first crack in splitting something open to get an understanding. It turns out um, nobody believed this data for like 50 years, though, because it was just seemed crazy. Because the only explanation was, well, maybe there's a huge amount of invisible matter out there, which nobody wanted to believe. It took a long time. But now we have lots of evidence of it. And in fact, you can even see dark matter out in the sky acting like big lenses, because dark matter can bend light if there's enough of it. And so if you see, if there's a big blob of matter out there in the sky between us and something else, then that, that um, matter can bend the light and act like a lens. And you see weird smearing effects in the sky due to that gravitational lensing. And so here, for example, is a, this is from one of the comic videos. Imagine that you're here on Earth, and there's some galaxy far, far away, and there's a blob of dark matter between you and the galaxy. The light that comes out from the galaxy gets bent by the dark matter towards you. Light that coming out this way from the galaxy gets bent by the dark matter towards you. So if you look here, you see that galaxy. If you look here, you see the same galaxy in two different directions. Right? That is a clue that there's dark matter lensing uh, between you and, and the galaxy. So here, for example, you can see this galaxy in one place and the same galaxy somewhere else. So if you look up in the sky and you see two versions of the same galaxy, you know there's something between you and it acting like a massive, I'm talking a really massive gravitational lens. So that's also evidence that there's dark matter out there. Uh, in addition, we saw um, out in the sky, just, just looking, people saw this incredible thing happen, which is two galaxies colliding. Right? Now, I'm a particle physicist. I get excited when we take two protons and smash them together. Okay? <laughs> this is an experiment on a different scale. Okay? Take two galaxies, smash them together. Astrophysicists don't get to design experiments. Right? They don't say, let's build a galactic collider. But they get to look for them because there are experiments just happening out there. But they have to be lucky and find them. So here they were lucky and they found two galaxies coming together. Now every galaxy has normal matter and also has dark matter in it. And what happened is the two galaxies collided, the normal matter smashed into itself in mammoth collisions just like you would expect, but the dark matter passed right through the other side. So the, the normal matter made a collision, but the dark matter just passed right through. So you separated the normal matter from the dark matter. You can actually see that if you look at this picture out in the sky, this red indicates normal matter, which is measured just by stars, and the blue is the dark matter, which is measured by the gravitational lensing. And so you can see that this was a mammoth collision, and the dark matter passed right through. So the dark matter, it's out there, it's heavy, but it hardly even interacts. Two galaxy-sized blobs of dark matter passed right through each other. Okay, so that's sort of humbling to remember that we've been studying this stuff in detail, and publishing thousands of papers a year on a tiny slice of the universe. If your goal is to get some big picture understanding of how the universe works, then it's sort of like uh, realizing that you've been studying the tail of an elephant for about 300 years. And finally, somebody walks you around to the front of the elephant and introduces you to the rest of it. It's a mind-blowing event, right? Now, as a physicist, your first inclination is going to be, well, I understand elephant tails. So I'm going to try and model entire elephants out of tails, right? <laughs> Maybe the rest of it is just a little perturbation on the tail or something. But what you really have to do is throw away everything you thought you understood and start from scratch, which again is one of the most exciting moments in science, right? Understanding that you know very little, being confronted with your lack of knowledge is the best thing in science because then you have something to do, right? You have an opportunity to learn. So that's why this kind of discovery is so amazing because we know how little we know, okay? So how do we make progress? How do we understand what the universe is made out of? What am I actually doing with myself, right? Well, if you want to understand how things are made, what you do is you take them apart. So 
if you're ever a curious child, maybe you took your toaster apart and you discovered it's made out of smaller elements, right? Screws and bolts and nuts. And then maybe you went on and took the blender apart and discovered that's also made out of screws and bolts and nuts. And you discovered that your kitchen, the fundamental objects of your kitchen, are not appliances, but components of appliances from which you can build almost any appliance, right? So you've made a discovery. The fundamental description of your kitchen is not the appliance level, it's at the component level. Okay, so, <coughs> excuse me. In particle physics, we do something similar, and we use these colliders. There was a collider outside of Chicago at Fermilab, it's called the Tevatron, which is the most powerful collider until about 2007, 2008. And now the most powerful collider in the world is um, in Switzerland, called the Large Hadron Collider, because it's large and it collides hadrons. Uh, it's at CERN, which is the European Center for Nuclear Research. And essentially, it takes the same idea, but, but says, let's not just take one thing apart, let's take two things apart simultaneously by smashing them together. Okay, so if we take our toaster analogy and extend it to ri the ridiculous level, what would happen if you built a toaster collider? Well, you take these two toasters, you speed them up, you smash them into each other, and you get a pile of parts at the end. And you say, well, I got two handles, so I'm going to guess is one handle per toaster. I got six of these kinds of screws, so I'm going to guess three per toaster, right? And your basic assumption is going to be that everything that went into the collision came out of the collision, or that everything that came out of the collision started out in the collision in a different arrangement, right? And that's going to be one of your most powerful clues. In particle physics, we can't do that. It turns out what you can do when you um, have a particle collision is you can take a lot of energy or momentum. So if you take, for example, something very small and give it a lot of energy and smash it together, you can actually make something new. So you can turn something which is very light but has a lot of energy, a lot of momentum, into something very heavy that moves very slowly. Because of this magical equation, you can turn energy into mass and back and forth. So we take very light particles, protons, speed them up to enormous energies to try to produce new kinds of particles. Okay, so what went into the collision doesn't have to come out of the collision. This is like, um, this is like modern day alchemy. We're turning one kind of stuff into new kinds of stuff. And you might think, well, that seems like a big disadvantage. It seems like it would be a big advantage to know that the, what came out of your collision was the same as what went in because you could help understand the arrangements of stuff, right? Turns out it's actually our po most powerful advantage that what comes out of the collision doesn't have to have been made from what went into the collision. How can that be an advantage? Because it means you don't have to know what's out there in order to make it. As long as you pour enough energy, enough momentum into your collisions, you can make anything. All right? It's sort of like, you know, there's a menu out there. There's a menu from someplace called Einstein's Cafe. And as long as you have enough energy in your collisions, you can look at like, the universe's menu of particles and say, anything I have enough energy to make, I will see it at the collider. So it really is a tool for exploration. You don't have to know what's out there in order to make it. You just pour enough energy into your machine, and you can make anything that, uh, that has mass less than the energy you put in. And this is why we try to build larger and larger and larger accelerators. Because the larger the accelerator, the more energy we can pour into the collisions, and the new, more new particles we can make. And this is why I think of, of it as exploration. So how much energy is in these machines? Well, this guy, a TeV, is 1,000 GeV. And remember, a GeV is how much energy is in a proton. So this has enough energy to make 2,000 protons, or something that's as heavy as 2,000 protons. This, the one at CERN, we ran for a while at 8 TeV. So four times this energy, and in 2015 we'll turn it on again at 14 TeV. The exciting thing about turning on an accelerator at a new energy is nobody's ever seen this stuff before. You turn it on, you pour energy into these collisions, you have no idea what's going to come out, right? But you know you know very little about the universe, so you've got to be ready for surprises. And the way I think of it is an analogy, like imagine, so so far before we turn on this accelerator, we use a 2 TV machine and, and, say, and explore the universe in that sense, right? When we turned on the LHC at ATEV, it's sort of equivalent to like simultaneously landing on four Earth-like planets, right? That's how exciting it was. Because you could find advanced civilizations waiting for you. You could find just piles of rocks. You have no idea what's out there. It's exploration. 
It's either going to be totally dull or amazingly fascinating in a way that revolutionizes your understanding of the world, the universe even, our place in it. So it's really an exciting moment. And I feel particularly lucky because um, I'm a pretty young guy. I wasn't around when they made the decision to start building this thing. Right? It was like in the early 80s when they decided to organize it and arrange it. And I was a tiny kid then. And the science that was happening to help us understand how little we know is also not, not um, I take no credit in that. But I happen to be here at this moment and have the facilities and the funds to use this amazing new tool that just came online to answer these incredible questions about the universe. So it's just really like a golden moment in particle physics right now to know how little you know and have access to these awesome tools to help us figure it out. Okay, so what could you make? Well, this is a diagram we like to call a Feynman diagram after Richard Feynman who made it up. And in these diagrams, time flows from left to right. And this axis doesn't really mean anything. But you have two particles that come in and they follow these lines. And what happens here is these two particles come in and then they turn into another kind of particle. Remember, I told you that what goes into the collision doesn't have to come out. These particles, they don't exist anymore. The stuff that was in them is gone. Their energy is turned into another kind of particle. All right? That particle doesn't live very long, and then it breaks out into two other kinds of particles. So you turn one kind of matter into another kind of matter. Right? Really, this is alchemy. Now, you can turn normal, everyday quarks into normal, everyday electrons, or you could turn it into slightly less unusual um, muons, or, and this is the interesting thing is, you can turn it into something totally new, something surprising, something nobody's ever seen before. What could we see? Well, you have to look sort of back in the history of the universe to get a clue for what we might discover. Because these days, so this is the history of the universe from the Big Bang to the present day, back in the era of the Big Bang, everything was pretty hot. These days, everything is pretty cold. I mean, it doesn't feel cold in California compared to the rest of the country this last few weeks, I know, but if you go out into outer space, it's pretty chilly, right? But it used to be that everything was pretty hot. The whole universe was a hot, dense plasma. There was a lot of energy density, even for making really heavy, weird particles. These days, the universe is mostly pretty cold and empty. You don't see these particles unless somebody artificially creates uh, a lot of energy in a small amount of space, like we're doing with these colliders. So essentially, we're looking back in time to the Big Bang. We may be creating particles that haven't existed in billions of years. So that's pretty exciting. And, you know, it opens up lots of possibilities. And people wonder, when we turn this thing on, people wonder, oh, you're going to create a black hole which might destroy the universe? And you remember, that, maybe you remember there's a lot of anxiety. This is one of my favorite cartoons, speculating that the beginning of our universe may have coincided with the end of the previous universe when they turned on their large Hadron <laughs> Collider. <laughs> Fortunately, that didn't happen. Okay, so I talked a lot about why this is interesting and how we build these colliders and, and why that's useful. Now I want to tell you about what actually happens in the collisions. It's difficult to actually see the collisions because the particles we're talking about are super tiny. They're tinier than the wavelength of light, so you can't take a picture of them. And they exist for like 10 to the negative 20 seconds, right? So you can't like watch a video of it. Even our know, best technology like scanning electron microscopes can't see these particles. So what do we do? Well, we build this collider. Here's a nice little movie of what happens. You zoom the particles up, and each of these is a little accelerator that, that um, gives it more and more energy to get ready for the next accelerator. And so it's a multi-stage thing. This is the SPS, which zooms these guys up to 450 GeV, and then it goes around the actual, the biggest ring at the LHC. And there are four points around the tunnel where these things there's not actually any graffiti inside the tunnel. <laughs> These things zoom around the tunnel, and there's four points when the particles collide. So they go in opposite directions around this ring, and at four points they collide. And so this is what's supposed to be a proton inside of the quarks. And you see it zooming along inside this tunnel, and then it gets to the interaction point, which is surrounded by our detector. The detector is supposed to sort of take a picture for us. It's not a camera, but it's a massive piece of electronics that takes a picture of the collision. And so what happens is the two particles collide, and a bunch of stuff sprays out. And what we can do is look at the stuff that's sprayed out. And we see patterns, we say, oh, there's something here, there's something here. And we try to deduce from those patterns what happened in the collision. And that is the goal of particle physics. And that's why we build these big detectors. Okay? And now each detector is very complicated. So you just saw the, a collision happening inside the detector. Now imagine a slice of the detector. So the beam comes in 
uh, into the screen here, and there's another one out of the screen. The two particles collide right here and produce a spray of stuff. Now, we designed our detector in rings around this point of collision so we can understand the stuff that comes out. And each slice of the detector has a different job. One of them measures whether it has momentum, another one tries to measure their energy, another one tries to measure its direction, and each different kind of particle, a muon, electron, the kind of stuff that flies out, leaves a different signature in our detector. So we can deduce, based on the pattern of digital trails that each particle left in the detector, what it was. We say, well, this was a photon, this was an electron, it had this direction, this much energy. So that's the kind of picture that we can build up of our detector. And these things are very complicated and very precise. Every time there's a collision, we read out data from 100 million sensors. Okay, and the collisions happen every 25 nanoseconds. So this is a huge amount of data, okay? And one of the most sensitive is at the very center, just very close to the collision, okay, the very center of the detector, this thing has 140 million pixels to take a, a picture of what happened just very to the moment very close to the collision. Um, so the Atlas detector, the one I work on, is, is at the accelerator just outside of CERN. Let me give you another picture of what the accelerator looks like. So here's the accelerator, right? And it's, uh, it's located next to Geneva, which is a beautiful place in between two sets of mountains and this fields of sunflowers. It's a nice place to spend the summer. And the detector itself is 100 meters underground. Um, and the reason it's underground is that in Switzerland, you don't have, to, the, you don't have land rights more than, uh, I think, 10 meters down. And so they can build this ring under people's property without having to pay them for it. And this is what the detector looks like. And you can see the scale. So this is a graduate student. And this is the scale of this thing. It's like a Borg ship. I mean, from here to here, it's like an 11-story building. Okay, And this was put together by a team of about 5,000 scientists. It cost uh, on lots of millions of dollars. It's one of the biggest machines mankind has ever made. Um, here's a, a better picture of it. And here, here's a graduate student for scale, right? Uh, so it's, it's like four stories high, and like, if you tipped it on a 10, it would be 11 stories tall. And uh, people have been working on this thing for years and years and years, starting in the 80s. And in, uh, in the end of the last decade, it turned it on, and it actually worked, right? And everybody was very excited. Uh, this is a, a picture from the control room when we saw the first collisions were actually happening, and you know, everybody had been pouring their life into this thing. So the fact that it worked was very exciting. Um, the Atlas Collaboration, the one I'm a member of, has more than 3,000 physicists, and, and then there's more if you include all the graduate students, et cetera, from a lot of different countries um, and all around the world, and everybody works together at CERN. It's really exciting to get to work from people, with people from all over the country on such a big project. Um, every time we publish a paper, however, that means that there are 3,000 names on the paper, and the policy is to make it alphabetical. So, I'm over here, <laughs> and here is a Hungarian graduate student whose last name is A-A-D, and I won't try to pronounce it for you, but he's the first author on every single paper from Atlas. Congratulations to him. Um, and the accelerator's been running really well, and if you measure, this is the date, see, so this is uh, 2004, this is um, the, the month, sorry, this is the 30th day of the month, like four, six, eight, this is a single year, and this we measure, it's called luminosity, essentially the number of collisions we've managed to accumulate. And you see that things are going well, you know, we take a break to fix something, things are going well, um, and anyway, this number is climbing. And the more collisions you get, the more chances you, you have to see something interesting. Okay, unfortunately, interesting things are very rare. So we have a very high collision rate, like 10 to the 8 collisions per second. Okay, that's a lot of collisions every second, 10 to the 8. But, uh, and only occasionally you see something like a W boson or a Z boson or a top quark. A Higgs boson, it takes 10 seconds of running at this rate before you make one Higgs boson. They're very rare. So mostly the stuff that happens is pretty boring stuff. It's, you have to run for a long time to see something interesting. Okay, so what is this Higgs boson? Finally working after this question. You've heard a lot about the Higgs boson. Why is it important? Why is it interesting? Well, it certainly has gotten a lot of press. Uh, when it was discovered, they got a lot of hyperbole in the press, you know, collisions that changed the world. Um, in the New York Times, they said, 
physicists whose collective efforts created the Large Hadron Collider and have revealed the deepest layer of reality our species has ever probed. Wow, that sounds pretty cool, even though I don't really know what it means, the deepest layer of reality. But <clears throat> what is the Higgs? Well, remember I told you that, that we're interested in this question of mass, right? Why the particles have different mass? What is mass anyway? Well, the Higgs particle is the one responsible for assigning the mass to different particles. It's the reason why one particle has a lot of mass and another particle doesn't have a lot of mass. Okay? So, but what do I mean by mass, right? And an hour ago, we heard the description of mass basically as mass is stuff. Mass is the amount of stuff in something. And that's fine for a macroscopic experiment, right? You're going to talk about medicine balls versus beach balls. It's correct, right? There's more stuff there. But what about when you're talking about a fundamental particle? What does mass mean when you're talking about a particle? Because particles are points. They don't have volume. In our theory, these particles are at no spatial extent. So what does it mean for one to have more mass than another one? It's not like there's more stuff packed in there, right? It turns out mass is just a characteristic of fundamental particles, the way electric charge is. Some particles have charge, like electrons. Some particles don't have charge, like neutrinos and neutrons. It's just a label you attach to the particle. It has a lot of mass. It doesn't have a lot of mass. In fact, you can think of it as sort of a different kind of charge. You like to think of electric charge as a characteristic a particle has. A mass is sort of like gravitational charge. If two particles have a lot of mass, then gravity pulls them together. If they don't have mass, gravity doesn't pull them together. Interesting about gravity, though, is because there's no negative mass particles, you have no repulsive gravity, right? Gravity is only attractive, which is one thing that makes it very interesting. <clears throat> okay, so then what, is it, what does mass mean? Well, mass still has the same connotation that we talked that, that you heard about. If something has a lot of mass, it's hard to speed it up and hard to slow it down. If something has a very small amount of mass, it's easier to speed it up and easier to slow it down. Why is that? Well, the Higgs field, so there's two parts to the Higgs boson. There's the Higgs boson itself, which is a particle, and then there's the Higgs field. The Higgs field is something which permeates the whole universe. Like back in the 1800s when the people talked about the ether. The Higgs field is something which fills the whole universe, and every particle feels it. But different particles feel it a different amount. So if a particle feels the Higgs field very strongly, then it has a lot of mass. The Higgs field makes it very hard for something to speed up, very hard for something to slow down. If you feel the Higgs field very strongly, if you can ignore the Higgs field, like a photon, which has no mass, then it's not hard to speed up and it's not hard to slow down. So the Higgs field is responsible for giving these particles mass because it's the reason it's hard to th for things to speed up or slow down. Okay? But there's still where the question remains, why do different particles feel the Higgs field differently? Right? This answers the question of why particles get mass. It doesn't answer the question of why different particles have a different amount of mass. It just changes the question from why do particles have different mass to why the particles feel the Higgs field differently. Okay? And we know that particles have very different amounts of mass. Electrons have almost no mass. Top particles have a lot of mass. So this is still an open question. Even though the discovery of the Higgs boson tells us that the Higgs field is what gives particles mass, we still don't know why there's a Higgs field and why some particles feel it more than other particles. So how do we actually see the Higgs? Well, we see the Higgs by making it. And we make it by taking our collider and slamming stuff into each other, and sometimes the Higgs comes out. The problem is, as I told you earlier, Higgs doesn't last very long. It lasts for 10 to negative 23 seconds. So we can't actually see it. What we see is the stuff that Higgs turns into. And one of the most common things for the Higgs to turn into is, for example, two bottom quarks. It can also turn into two photons or two Z bosons. Okay, so what we do is we look for those things that Higgs can turn into. We try to find, in our trillions and trillions of collisions, collisions that look just like the Higgs boson. The problem is, for every time you make a Higgs boson, right, like this one, that turns, in this case, into two bottom quarks, there's lots of other ways to make two bottom quarks. In fact, the other ways to make the two bottom quarks are much, 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 much more common than the ways to make Higgs boson. So you have to somehow not just see that there were two bottom quarks, but figure out which ones came from the Higgs. So this is a very tricky problem, and we do it statistically. So we have two theories. We have a theory that says, 
Uh, this is what you would tend to see if there were no Higgs bosons. All right, so there's lots of other ways to make uh, collisions of a certain amount of energy, right, like I showed you in the previous slide. And if there is a Higgs boson, you would see a little blip in this curve because all the Higgs bosons would pile up at the same energy. The problem is, and you can barely see it on this plot, is that the difference between these two predictions is very, very small. Because you have a lot of other stuff that looks like Higgs bosons, and the Higgs bosons themselves are very rare. Right? So we call this the background, the stuff that looks just like the Higgs bosons, and this signal sits on top of the background. So how do you distinguish two hypotheses that have almost no difference in their prediction? You need a lot of data. Okay? You need to take a lot of measurements to see the difference between these two. So that's why we run this thing uh, in the comic, we say, you know, open 24 hours over a billion collisions served. We run this thing 40 million times a second, all day, all year long. That means there are people sitting in the control room there, even in the middle of the night at 3 a.m., running this thing, because you need a lot of data to separate these two hypotheses to know which one is the right answer. So what I'm going to do is show you the actual data. So that was the accumulation of the data from the beginning of the accelerator to the end. You see how it builds up, and there's a lot of statistical fluctuation. And in the end, these are our two hypotheses. The blue line is what we would have expected to see if there was no Higgs boson. And the red line is what we expect to see if there is a Higgs boson right here at 125 GeV. Okay, and it's maybe not to totally overwhelming to look at, right? But this is the evidence that, conclude, that persuaded us that there is a Higgs boson in the universe, right? These handfuls of collisions, this is amounts to about, you know, three, four hundred collisions taken out of trillions and trillions and trillions that look like the evidence for a Higgs boson. This is where a Higgs goes to two photons. What you do is you take the energy of the two photons, you add them together. And, and that's what this is a plot of. The Higgs can also go to other stuff. For example, the Higgs can go to two Z bosons, which then decay into different leptons. And this is the top of the histogram here is what you expect with no Higgs boson. And then this blue part is what you expect from the Higgs boson. And you see here's the data from the collider. It tends to agree with the with the Higgs boson hypothesis more than it tends to agree with the no Higgs boson hypothesis. So here's the peak right here. So um, <clears throat> I hope I've convinced you that we're in an exciting area in particle physics. Um, I like to think that 200 years from now, people will look back and say, wow, that was really the moment when we understood the first X, Y, Z mysterious answer about the universe which changed our understanding of the universe and our, our relationship uh, to the rest of the universe. Um, you know, I, I think back at like, the development of quantum mechanics, I think, wow, that was really interesting. I wish I'd been there at that time to help figure that stuff out. But here we are poised at perhaps an even larger revolution in our understanding of the way the world works. Now, if you're worried about the continued running the LHC, there's a website you can check. Um, it's called has the large hadron collider destroyed the world yet? dot com, <laughs> and I, I promise it's constantly kept up to date. <laughs> you can check it at any moment. Um, and if you're interested in learning more, I do have these web comics which try to explain uh, dark matter and the Higgs boson and other stuff. Uh, you can you can see them on my website here. Um, so I hope you've enjoyed that, and I'm happy to answer questions afterwards. Thank you.